everybody. Welcome to Plant Liker episode two. I'm your host, Steve Rogenbach. Oh, here's another day where I appreciate plant life. Fuck you. I love plants. All right. It's finally time for episode two. You know, I was thinking, I was trying to record an episode two uh, just a couple days after the first episode, but I wasn't really getting good stuff. But now I'm out in the backyard shed behind Boost House. Uh, so now I got the good luck home field advantage, and uh, wow, it's just unstoppable now. Yeah, I'm back in Tucson for the new year. I did the show in Toronto. It was wild. Just whipped into Canada for like 12 hours, did this show. It was, it was cool. Um, back in Tucson, it's rainy here, which is... I understand it to be weird for this time of the year in Tucson. Last winter in Tucson, it was very much just totally blue skies every day no clouds no moisture really but here we got we got some slow rains coming in and it's kind of wild stuff today i decided to uh get back on snapchat it's kind of a you know i've been on and off of there for so long uh you know i've i've made pushes to do it to really do it to document my tours to you know do some funny little skits on there kind of similar to how my videos are but i sometimes do it for a while and then i quit so we'll see if i stick on it or not i'm hoping to stick on it because i think it's really like the place where most people are paying more attention so it makes sense for me to to, to use it, but it's just, wow, there's a lot of different social networks to try to balance if you're trying to stay up with that stuff, and really, uh, this year, my main priority is to make sure that I keep making the podcast, and uh, even more than that, keep making the YouTube videos, because I know that's what's really gonna matter long term, you know, that I built this archive of work that people can find and go through and spend, you know, hours listening to it all, you know, so, and watching the videos, so that's what I'm focusing on. Uh, but Snapchat is there. Add me if you're on there. My name is just Steve Roganbuck. Um, whoo, this past week I've also been learning about my blood. Shouts out to my own blood and to your blood and everyone's because it's pretty amazing stuff, you know. Um, I'm taking an anatomy and physiology class on Khan Academy currently. I do recommend it. And um, I learned that bones actually make blood. Certain bones uh, in the marrow, in the ends, you know, like in your long bones in your leg, for example, um, in the ends of those bones... Uh, there's spots where they're making a lot of blood in, in there and um, kind of wild stuff. I learned that bones have blood vessels in them. And I'm like, what the heck? Who's been hiding this from me for all my life? Christ! Ah! Well, I hope y'all are feeling good. Uh, it's time for episode two of Plant Liker. Um, I'm going to roll into this first question. Actually, it's something that connects to my Snapchat story because... So I was making a few videos in my little bedroom today for my Snapchat story. And the thing about it was that, uh, you know, I was recording like, okay, this is where I sleep. Here's my bed, quote unquote. You know, this is my little room. But actually, my bed is just a sort of yoga mat type thing on the floor and um my room is actually a walk-in closet to one of the bedrooms here in boost house and uh for a while here we actually had other open bedrooms in the house and so i could have taken one of those rooms but i didn't i took this closet and i'm sticking with it and um, you know, the choice to sleep on the floor was also a choice. I mean, I did partly do it to save money, not have to buy a bed again, but it's also a choice and it's kind of, I feel like speaking to that a little bit, some people have asked me like, why would you choose to live in a closet or why would you choose to not have a bed? Uh, somebody actually responded to me on Snapchat saying, why is your bed so bad and low? <laughs> uh, and the thing is, it's actually not that bad to sleep on the floor. Now, you can look up different stuff on the 
on the internet about it, different people's experiences. Some people I think it works better for than others. So just shouts out and you could try it out if you want. I I like it mostly, you know. I don't like it if I'm with somebody that I'm trying to be like cuddling with and stuff because it's kind of like you really want to just be able to roll around and have a nice soft surface. Uh, but, you know, if you're just sleeping by yourself and you're actually just sleeping in the bed, then it's like, not bad to just have a little yoga mat or some kind of other pad, sleeping, a camping pad, something like that, and I actually use a sleeping bag, and for me, it saved me a little bit of money from buying a bed. I know that beds, mattresses can start at like a hundred bucks, so it's not a huge savings, and you could probably get them used or free, uh, you know, if you have the right connections, but, you know, I just was trying it out, and it's kind of minimalist, it's kind of just like, and people say it's good for your back to sleep on the floor, so that's partly what it is, and I don't mind it, you know, I also travel a lot, so I end up sleeping on a bunch of different couches and guest beds and stuff, but um, I like having that little simple, simple mat on the floor. Now, why I choose to sleep in the closet is kind of harder for me to describe. Partly it was my last bedroom, I didn't have hardly any stuff to put in it, so it was just this big, open, empty room. That just seems kind of useless, right? Like, what? I'm taking up all this space, but I don't need it, you know? Um, I could do exercise in there or something, but I'm not... Re I mean, I, I just go outside and run for exercise most of the time, so... Um, Anyway, it's just kind of it's just kind of all I need, you know, and I don't want to take up more than I need, kind of. Um, and I kind of it's also funny. It's also funny. That's I shouldn't downplay that. That's actually a main aspect of why I like living in a closet currently is that I think it's funny. And it's also I think it will I think it would be increasingly funny the more successful that I get. Or, for example, I was thinking of for a while. I was thinking I was getting into nutrition a lot. I was thinking I, I might go back to. Uh, school and get a dietetics degree or get a or even become a doctor what if I became a doctor and then I was living in a closet a doctor who lives in a closet now wouldn't that be something now you might think wh wh what's the point why and I'm like well I don't know but something about that make speaks to me and actually my goal is to live in a closet under the stairs type thing like Harry Potter style that's my true style um, that I would like to try out at least. But currently the walk-in closet's doing great. It's very messy in there currently. I like to clean it up a little bit. But I've got a banana stockpile going in there. I've gotten some bananas ripening in there. Um, and I got some garbanzo bean cans just piled up at the foot of my little bed mat. So I can, you know, I got garbanzo beans there anytime. I've got some nuts. I got some Brazil nuts lately I've been eating. But only a couple a day to keep the selenium content within a decent range, Okay. All right, well, let's get on with the show. Oh, happy birthday to you. Okay, so... The next thing that I'll talk about is... I got this question on Twitter DM that said, I'm really into the vegan lifestyle. So when I buy shoes and clothing, I try to buy products that are vegan and ethical. I've done a little research into brands that fit that bill, but they're either not sold in my area, so I can't try them on, or they are prohibitively expensive. I don't like compromising, like ethically compromising, but I also like protection from the elements and appearing minimally fashionable. What's a boy to do? Yours truly, little American boy in Berlin. So, shouts out to the little American boy in Berlin. Thank you for sending me this question. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you for caring what I would have to say in response. Let's get into it. There's a couple different things. One, I don't know what stores they have in Berlin, what chains and what local stores, but I know that for me, for clothing specifically, thrift stores are what I usually go to. Um, and other secondhand places like recycled fashion, whatever, type places like that. In the USA, the place where I go to usually when I'm in a city that has it is a Buffalo Exchange. It's a pretty good chain store uh, that has a lot of, they do, it's all second hand mostly, but it's like, um, it's selected out for a specific range of fashion styles that 
usually includes a lot of stuff that I like. So usually if I go there and look around, they'll have stuff actually in a good style and size for me at a decent price. Usually those are a little bit more expensive than something like Goodwill or Salvation Army, where it's just straight up thrift store, whatever people donate, they put it all in there. I think pretty, they're not as selective with style and stuff. Um, but you know, and those those stores are are pretty good option too. Usually, I've got my winter coat is one that I actually got three years ago, I believe, or maybe four, uh, three I think, and it was two dollars at a I can't remember what chain thrift store, but it was just you know something. And uh, so you know, I'd say thrift stores are an option, but obviously you can't get everything at them all the time. Depending specifically, you know, if you want something specific, whatever, you know. Um, but I'll tell you something else, ethical purchasing or boycotting is only one tool that we have to make a difference. And so even if you have to end up buy, buying something that wasn't ethically made or, you know, for whatever reason, because there's lots of practical times in life where it's very hard to get something ethically made or like you're freaking starving and there's nothing that's, in your opinion, ethical at the place where you are or if you're like you know you're gonna be freezing your ass off and there's nothing ethical that can keep you warm but you know I mean there's different situations in life you know overall it's like what we buy is only one aspect and with boycotts especially sometimes they're not even super effective if they're not that strategic or that targeted you know uh I remember hearing debate about this around the boycott as part of a uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the BDS movement against Israel, um, which is used to put financial pressure on Israel to stop illegally occupying the Palestinian territories and to allow the right of return of Palestinian citizens and to stop discriminating against Palestinians who live in Israel. So this BDS movement incorporates boycott as a main tactic, but it's not just like boycott everything that has anything to do with Israel. It's not like that. That would be like too sloppy. That wouldn't really even work. They wouldn't feel the impact of you boycotting every single little thing that has any connection at all to the country. What they're doing is they're targeting specific corporations that are complicit in specific stuff like Caterpillar, which creates the militarized bulldozers that demolish Palestinian homes when Israel is taking over more land from them. Stuff like that. There's HP, Hewlett Packard, is the computer company, but they provide the biometric IDs and checkpoints, like the checkpoint system that like makes Palestinians' lives fucking awful, that they have to go through all these checkpoints to get from different areas in Palestine. Um... What are the other ones? There's SodaStream, which has its uh, its factories uh, in like a uh, illegal Israeli settlement in Palestine. There's uh, Sabra Hummus. I can't remember what they did, but you know it's like something like that again. They're intensely involved in the occupation, um, and so anyway, there's this campaign, and they have these specific companies that they highlight as being really involved and like they push everybody to boycott those ones and they make it into a full campaign it's not just like a couple ethical consumers going to the store and deciding not to buy that two dollar sabra hummus thing it's like a whole campaign where we're making arguments about it we're getting press to say hey stop this you know um and it, that whole effect is much bigger than just one person boycotting this one product in this one instance, you know? And veganism is kind of interesting to think about that way because veganism does include boycott. It includes a major boycott, you know, uh, of lots of different things that include animal products and animals used for labor and different things. Um, and sometimes it's not, it's not that targeted, but I think it still makes sense to boycott pretty much everything with animal products most of the time because I think it helps us, it pushes us to create more different culture. It's like if we go to every meal saying, no, we're not going to eat the animal foods. We're done with that. We are going to create a new culture. We're going to create a different way of eating. We're going to start looking at how we can make different plant foods and how we can make cake and different foods that we've always loved in a, in a way that doesn't include animal foods so we can get away from those industries. You know, it's a whole, you got to look at the bigger picture 
um, of like creating a different culture and creating change and a different world and not get so caught up all the time about every specific ethical consumerist choice, you know? Because in the capitalist world, we're often told that activism is buying this product instead of that product, but ultimately that's not gonna be, you know I mean? Sure, you know, buy the buy the products by the more ethical company. You wanna give, you know, resources to the companies that are gonna do better things, and but, um, you know, that's not all we have. So if you need to end up buying something that you think is not ethical, I say, you know, whatever. That's not the only way that you're helping, you know. You can help in many other ways. And with, with vegan stuff specifically, that might mean, you know, getting involved to, you know, get more vegan options in the cafeteria or dining halls at your school or going to different demonstrations or showing people different documentaries about it or just having conversations with friends about it or anything like that, you know. And so it's not just what you put in your mouth or on your body or what you pay for it every single day. Now, the bigger issue that I wanted to speak to, otherwise related to that, is uh, this thing I tweeted in the fall. I said, shout out to the people who want to be full vegan, but for whatever reason you can't right now. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or something. And I think I already basically just explained why. But you know, there's many people who, because of their situation, maybe their work situation or their home life, their family situation or something else, education, where they live, their access to different foods, their economic status, different things, all these things could affect how easy or how difficult it is to be vegan. And for some people, it might be prohibitively difficult at this time where in our society, like, 1% or less of people is vegan. I don't really know the percentage and it varies from area to area quite a bit. But you know, in right now in society for some people, it is a really huge demand to be 100% vegan, you know? So what I'm telling people is I think it's a really positive decision if you can and if your situation allows for it, fucking refuse to eat animal products, fucking build new ways, experiment new ways. It's going to be great for your health. It's going to be great to get this ball rolling and to get more and more people aware and thinking about it and practicing different ways. But if you personally can't get animal products totally out of your diet or whatever for whatever reason i think that's fine it doesn't make you a bad person or anything you know um and 100 percent personal purity should not be the point in my opinion it's about moving the world in a direction that we need to go in general, society society needs to move toward eating a very much more plant focused diet, much less animal products, and um, so that's something. Now it's cold out here. Is something I didn't tell y'all. It's cold out here in this shed because it just rained, and in Tucson it's very interesting. Right after it rains is when it's the coldest. Usually, I've noticed that in general. Also, it's January, but, you know, that's usually not that cold here in Tucson, but shouts out. Anyway, um, hope you appreciated those two little rants, um, stuck together there. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So there's one, at least one other thing I wanted to talk to in this episode. And that is somebody asked, and I actually get questions like this quite a bit related, you know, off something like this. A uh, person asks, can you teach us how to self-publish our own books and stuff? So there's different parts to this. The first thing is, I'll, I'll address if you literally just want to get a physical printed book of your book writing, you know, like that part is actually pretty easy, I think. So the company that I've used so far has been 48 hour books. You can look them up online. They have a price calculator on their site. So you can look up their different prices for different page count and different types of cover and different types of stuff like that. You just send them PDFs of your files, uh, and what you want the cover to look like. And, and in the inside, they can even help you with editing those files a little bit if needed. I I would be a little bit wary of that because I I don't think their design work is very good. Like they're they're good printers and they have good customer service, decent prices, but I don't think they're good designers. So I would say, you know, if you have an artist friend or somebody who can really do the design and layout for you, you know, have them do that and and have these PDFs ready to send them. Um 
But, you know, they can print. They're, they've been a good company to me. Uh, they're based in Ohio, USA, or some, somewhere around there. And, um, but I've also learned a lot about a uh, lightning source, and which works in conjunction with another thing called Ingram uh, Distribution um, and Ingram Spark, which is what they use to print the smaller press run books I think so I've been I've been looking into that printer as well Ingram Spark uh, especially for self-published people uh, allows you to do print on demand which means that you could just have them print one copy and then mail it to the person who bought it and you don't even have to receive the books of course you can order books for yourself you can order whatever stockpile you like um, but it, you can also get them to just mail one to a specific person when that when it gets ordered so that way you're not necessarily sitting on as big of a stockpile so that's a company that I've heard good things about whatever I think they're a bigger company whereas 48 hour books is a little bit of a smaller company to support if you like um, but besides that whole issue also I should say lightning source and Ingram spark I think allow you to get your book on Amazon and different different booksellers to make it available to them and to get it out to those places pretty easily. So that's an option. Um, and then what I will say next, you know, getting your book printed, in my opinion, is actually the easy part. That's the much easy part. That is, you know, I mean, writing your book could be easy or could be hard depending how hard you work on it and how amazing of a book it's going to end up being and all that but you know printing it is pretty easy building an audience that will actually buy your self-published book that's the hard part in my opinion and so I want to speak just a little bit of advice on that because it's something I've thought about and tried a lot over the years and so if there happens to be anybody who's in a similar situation wanting to create a self-published book or even creating something else maybe you're a musician and you create your you know self-published albums or whatever and you want to get people to you want to build an audience and create different opportunities for this stuff you know I've done some workshops at universities and uh, different places Places now, art centers, uh, where I talk about using social media to build an arts career. And it sounds kind of corny or kind of like promotional in a way that a lot of artists don't like, but honestly, I really have an interest in figuring out how to reach an audience, especially on social media because it's all these new platforms that are distributing power in a new way, and there's a lot of new opportunity that a lot of people don't aren't aware of fully, you know? And so Ooh, there's a lot of different things I could say about this. The you know the workshop that I have done is like 45 minutes to an hour long, usually plus Q and A. But what I'll say is the overall structure. I think an overall distribution model or overall business model for building an audience for your work that will then buy your self-published book is something like this. Okay, as you're making the book, as you're you know, whether it's poems or whatever you're going to put in there, drawings, comics, whatever it is, as you're making it, be releasing it piece by piece on the internet also, you know, be putting it out. And if your content can look good visually, like if you can put your poem into some form that looks good visually, then put it on Instagram. Instagram is the a place that's really got a lot of attention right now, so it's a good place to build up an audience on there. Also, you can try, you know, Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, different places. Instagram's really a good place if your stuff has a visual dim uh, dimension to it. If you're good at delivering your work, you know, speaking it aloud, performing it, different stuff like that, then I say definitely use, you know, YouTube and get, you know, the videos of you reading each poem as you're writing them for the book. If your best at just having little one-liners of text if your book is mostly you know these little zingers these little lines of poetry uh then you know maybe twitter is a good place to focus on and then you can still use the other ones as well again you know um but you know really putting it out piece by piece building you know building an archive of this content online and an expectation that you post regularly with your creative content online really doing that and then also <clears throat> you know building community around that and that can be a lot of different things but if anybody if anybody loves your work if anybody comments positively or follows you or likes your poems or whatever you know comment them back you know follow them back Look at their work. See who they are. Start a conversation. Really, like, do these things 
to build community because it's good in all ways, but especially so that they stick around so that they don't just, they're not just passing through your Instagram and they like one of your poems one day, but that you actually build a friendship with them that's ongoing. And then they keep coming back. And then maybe by the time you're going to put out a book, they've seen a good amount of your stuff and you've built up a friendship and then, oh, they're going to buy it because they want to support you. And they've seen how good your work is and all this. You see what I'm saying? And now, depending how hard you go at this, you know, finding different people online, starting conversations, uh, drawing attention to your page by just putting out the content regularly and going to other people's pages and liking stuff and commenting stuff and, you know, getting more people to come check out your stuff back. You know, you might build up a couple hundred people, a couple thousand people or whatever, but by the time you are done with the book, by the time you have the book ready, you'll probably have at least some of a following of people who will order it, you know? And then, you know, put out that book, ask them sincerely, hey, this would mean a lot if you guys supported this book, you've seen all the work I've been putting into this over the past year, it would mean a lot to have your support, put it out, try to get, you know, as many sales as you can, uh, but then, you know, Start working on the next book. Keep putting out your more content, you know, and keep building up. Keep having those conversations. Keep building relationships. And, you know, that's just sort of, that's a model for how you can self-publish and it will actually, you build. What's interesting, see, I still self-publish and I've gotten offers from different small press poetry publishers that they want to publish me, but I'm like, well, what are you really offering me though? Because, and not, I'm not saying that in an arrogant way, but like, because I've put out so much of my own content and I have people subscribing and following me on all these different social networks, I have my ideal target audience right there already collected. And so... The, the most powerful place for my book to be promoted is on my own social media. And so I just post it out on my social media and the people who have been following me on there for my individual poems, they'll be like, oh, now I can get a whole book. And he's offering to write in it and it's on sale for $8. Yeah, I will get that, you know. And so that's how it works. Also, when you self-publish, you do get a higher profit margin per book obviously because you don't have to split it with the publisher or anything so that can be nice um i'm sure if you got a big publisher to publish you they would reach more people than you could uh, buy your own self-publishing but uh but self-publishing is not always a bad option for me i like it it gives me a lot of freedom and you know it's a pretty good profit margin like i said and it sort of keeps everything you know, in my own hands. Uh, so, so that's a little tip. Hopefully that was interesting to some of you, something to think about if you feel like building a powerful audience for your art. Whoop. And uh, that's also a shout out if anybody wants to book me to come give the full lecture of that at their school or something, especially if you're at an art school or something, I would love to do that. In February, I'm going to Europe. I'm going to the UK especially, but I'm bounce. I might do. I'm doing Norway and I think Sweden and I th think Berlin as well. So nice. I think this was a good episode. So uh, send me more questions. Send me more queries. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks everybody who supports me in so many different ways. I feel really grateful right now. I feel like I got a lot of people who are just telling me nice stuff online and. A lot of people are trying to help me uh, do my work and get it out there, so I appreciate that. Hope you have a really, really good day, the best day, you know, and, um, you know, you are alive right now. It's true. Maybe if you feel like crap later, it's still going to be true, though. Think about your blood. Think about your blood. It's doing amazing stuff in there. The oxygen is coming in through your lungs, which have on average, around 500 million tiny air sacs in them. That is an extremely high number. That is half of 1 billion. And the 
uh, the blood is picking up the oxygen. Uh, it, they, it knows how to do that. It loves doing that for you. The hemoglobin are so in love with the oxygen and they just carry it around your whole body and they drop it off on your cells and then your oxygen helps you to frickin' use your uh, glucose from your food that you've been eating and man, it just gives you energy to do the things that you need to do and wow, what, do, what are we gonna do with it? What are we gonna do with it? Our blood is carrying around the oxygen to our cells. What will we do with it today and tomorrow and this week? We can do something good. We can do something at least a little bit good. Maybe we can't do everything that we wish that we could do, but we could at least walk up to somebody else and say something that makes them feel really good. Or we could do something that is like, fuck the system. Woo! Okay. Let's calm down a little bit, and I'm out of here, folks. I'm out of here. Plant Liker episode two signing off. Eat more whole plant foods if you can, and hail Satan if you want to. No pressure.